Hello, my name is Vincent Van Buren, and this video gives an introduction to normal distributions. The collected frequencies of observed values for a given metric is called a distribution. Many types of metrics are normally distributed. Many statistical tests are performed with the assumption that the data examined are normally distributed. Normal distributions follow a familiar bell-shaped curve as seen here. The consistency of the shape of normal distributions allows the development of statistical tests that can be applied to any normal distribution of data, regardless of position or scale. One question that arises is why do normal distributions arise in so many observed data sets? And we'll follow up on that later with an explanation of, of that that gives an intuitive understanding. Population versus sample. The population is the set of all individuals of interest. It's characterized by parameters. And those parameters are the mean, and standard deviation. The sample is the set of observations that are actually collected. All the methods we develop assume that the sample was drawn at random from the population. Statistics computed from samples estimate the population parameters. Here are the parameters of the normal distribution, the mean, and the standard deviation. Given with the symbols mu and sigma. We can see that the mean is just the simple average of the observed values in the distribution, and the standard deviation uh, is given as the square root of the sum of the deviations from the mean squared divided by n. The only difference that we make when considering the sample mean and the sample standard deviation are that the symbols are different. So for the sample mean, which is an estimate of this population mean, the sample mean we use the symbol x bar, so an x with a line on top of it. And standard deviation, we just use the symbol s, lowercase s. Another uh, small difference is that in the equation for standard deviation that's estimated from the sample, we use n minus 1 in the denominator. Because normal distributions have a consistent shape, the fraction of observations in a particular region of a normal distribution is also consistent. For example, we know that approximately 68% of observed values will be between one standard deviation below the mean and one standard deviation above the mean with respect to the mean at the center of the distribution. Likewise, approximately 95% of observed values in the distribution will be found between two standard deviations below the mean and two standard deviations above the mean. Finally, Approximately 99% of observations are found between three standard deviations below the mean and three standard deviations above the mean. So let's return to the idea of why distributions like this are typically this normal shape or bell-shaped curve. That many measured quantities follow a normal distribution is a convenient fact for the development of a standard approach to comparing the means of different groups of observations. Let's develop an intuition for why so many measured values are normally distributed. If we consider the role of a single die, we can see that each possible outcome is equally likely. So there is a 1 6 probability of rolling a 1, and a 1 6 probability of rolling a 2, and so on. If we rolled a die a large number of times, we would get a uniform distribution, where the frequencies of each possible observed value are approximately the same with variations due to chance. The uniform distribution has a flat shape, as we would see here. Now, if we consider the sum of two dice, the situation is very different. There are 36 different combinations of the two faces of the dice, all of them equally likely. However, the addition of the two faces results in sums that are not uniform. For example, there is only one combination of two dice that results in a sum of two. That would be 1 and 1, while there are 5 combinations of 2 dice that result in a 7, 1 and 6, 2 and 5, 3 and 4, 4 and 3, 5 and 2, and 6 and 1. What we can learn from this is that if a measurement results from the sum of two factors, the resulting distribution will take on a shape that looks more like a normal distribution than a uniform distribution. As it turns out, if we add more than two factors, the resulting distribution becomes more bell-shaped, taking on the characteristic appearance of a normal distribution. This histogram shows the result of a simulation where five dice were rolled 10,000 times. This demonstrates that adding multiple factors 
that independently follow a uniform distribution will result in a normally distributed sum. This is an empirical demonstration of this fact rather than a rigorous mathematical proof. The connection between this idea and biomedical experiments is that many quantities measured in biomedical experiments are a summation of numerous underlying factors and so tend to be normally distributed. There are, however, measurements that are not normally distributed. If the assumption that data are normally distributed is strongly violated, then it may be necessary to use different approaches for characterizing the distribution and for making comparisons between groups. The top distribution in this figure is positively skewed, where the mean is higher than where the peak of the distribution occurs, and there is a longer tail on the right. Below that is a normal distribution. A negatively skewed distribution, not shown, would have a mean lower than where the peak of the distribution occurs, or the mode, and a long tail to the left. It is often sufficient to make a histogram of the data to do a visual appraisal of normality when it is not known in advance that the data are normally distributed. When summarizing data, we need to consider the shape of the distribution to choose the best way to summarize data. When the value of a variable is more likely to fall near the mean than far from it, as is true with a normal distribution, and it is equally likely to fall below the mean as above it, also true of a normal distribution in the sense that it is symmetrical, then we use the mean and standard deviation to describe the location and amount of variability. So these two traits are things that we look for in deciding that something is normally distributed. And when it is normally distributed, then the mean and standard deviation are a good description of that distribution. However, uh, if we have data set that is not normal or skewed either to the left or to the right, then we use the median and at least two other percentiles to describe the data. The median is the value that half of the members of the population fall below. To compute the median, you simply put the observations in order from smallest to largest. If we have an odd number of observations, then the median is just the middle observation in that list of sorted numbers. If there is an even number of observations, then the median is between the two middle observations or an average of those two middle observations. Percentiles are defined analogously to the median. For example, the 25th percentile point, the point that defines the lowest quarter of observations, would be computed by multiplying 0.25 by n plus 1 to give us the observation that is equal to the 25th percentile. So if we have, for example, 99 observations, we multiply 0.25 by 99 plus 1, or 100, giving us the 25th observation as the 25th percentile point. In cases where this equation results in a non-integer, we would average if, it, if the number is between two different observations. So defining percentiles in this way also uh, is another way of defining the median, which is merely the 50th percentile. We can use percentiles as a way of checking whether a distribution is normal or not. This is done by considering how the standard deviations from the mean correspond to different percentiles in a normal distribution. So the mean should be near the 50th percentile, and the mean minus one standard deviation or one, one standard deviation below the mean should correspond to the 16th percentile, and so on, as shown in this graph. Uh, when this is strongly violated, then we can make an assertion that our data are not normally distributed. Here's a question with respect to the idea of uh, what percentage of the population falls within certain standard deviations of the mean. Question, I learned the 68%, 95%, 99% rule that the respective percent of the data in a normal distribution falls within one standard deviation, two standard deviations, three standard deviations, why are the critical values used for computing the 95% and 99% confidence intervals 1.96 and 2.53 rather than 2 and 3? The reason for that is that using the numbers 2 and 3 are estimated numbers that are convenient for computing approximately the 95th and 99th percent confidence intervals. The actual uh, confidence intervals computed from these choices of 2 and 3 times the standard deviation are actually 0.9545, so the 95th 
99.45 percentile and 99.73 percentile. So that explains the use of 1.96 and 2.53 as critical values. But keep in mind that confidence intervals are meant to describe our confidence about the mean, not our confidence about the original data. That is why when we compute confidence intervals, we multiply by the standard error of the mean instead of standard deviation to get the confidence interval. So here, standard error of the mean can be estimated for a single sample as the standard deviation divided by the square root of n, where n is the number in the sample size. And so the 95% confidence interval is equal to the mean plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error of the mean. And the 99th percent confidence interval is equal to the mean plus or minus 2.53 times the standard error of the mean. That concludes this video. Thank you for your attention.